there was buzz about Eileen Garvin's first novel. The Music of Bees is the story of three lonely strangers who meet by chance on a bee farm in Oregon. Each has been wounded by life, but through the bees and their unlikely friendship, they find hope and healing. I think it's an uplifting story, and I hope you do too. Thank you. Everyone did. Eileen was virtually everywhere. And being asked. Working on something new? We do I, have that I am. Yeah, I am working on something. I would I, I think the last question I usually ask people is are are you working on anything new? It's are a you? good last question of the night, and it's what's the next book? Eileen Garvin's second novel, Crow Talk, is an achingly beautiful story of love, grief, friendship, and the healing power of nature in the darkest of times. Nature that will look very familiar to the Spokane audience. Leading tonight's conversation is Spokesman Review columnist and fellow nature lover, Amy Midstock. Please welcome Eileen Garvin to the Northwest Passages stage. Whoa. <laughs> Every time I do this, I'm like, those are some bright lights. Can you, can you, I know you can hear us, but can you see our pores? <laughs> <laughs> I can so, see your pores. Your pores look okay. great from good, here. Good, good. It's because yeah. I drank four ounces of water because yeah. Christy told me I had to. Good job, Christy. Yeah, somebody's got to keep us on track here. So how are you doing? You've been running around like crazy. Running. New book. New book. Yes, I'm doing great. So happy to be here in my hometown in Spokane. <laughs> see all these faces I haven't seen in ages. Oh, really? Yes, I... I am one of those people that kind of avoided um, high school reunions and, and things like that. So it's all here now. It's like one of those dreams you have where you're like, do I know you from high school or from grade school? Or was it a COVID fever dream that I saw you? Yeah. Wouldn't you want to go to high school reunions though? Because I mean, honestly, you come back and you're like, yeah, I did okay. <laughs> I, got, I got some really famous books. Well, I'll think about that next time. Yeah, 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 really, really. And let's go shopping together first, too. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Eileen is my new best friend. So back off yes. any other people, all you all in the front row who think you're Eileen's best friend. <laughs> um, congratulations on this book. This is, it's really just Thank you. Thank fantastic. You. Yes. I am biased because, uh, as noted, I love the outdoors. And I was so impressed and taken in by your words and your ability to linguistically like bring to life the mountains. And I am curious um, about your own experience there, like this, this lake, your time in the woods. You talked about being a wannabe biologist. Tell me about that. There's um, many layers there, and I think the, something that I forget to, to tell people, people often comment that they like the detail about the outdoors and the natural world and, and why am I interested in that. And um, prior to writing The Music of Bees, I was working as a uh, writer for a custom publisher where I was doing a lot of travel and tourism writing. And a lot of that world, you are trying to describe a place that people haven't been to to try and encourage them to visit it. And I'm sorry, I'm a recovered travel and tourism writer. I don't want anyone to go anywhere anymore. Just stay home and enjoy your own place. But, but it really was, you know, it, that's, it, I, I had a lot of practice kind of evoking local detail. Um, the wannabe biologist part is that I have, um, I, I would say my family is divided in half, humanities on one side and science on the other, and I'm, I'm definitely on the humanities side, but I've always very much admired my sciencey relatives, and I have a lot of science friends, and um, I do not have a science brain. Uh, so, so writing an, uh, an ornithologist or in the music of bees when I wrote about beekeeping, it's kind of as close as I'm going to get to, to living that life. I can inhabit it, that world through my characters. Ah. Uh. And you, you definitely did. And how did you how did you pick on G. Gordon's book? Was that just sort of where you're like, oh yes, so this is where my research will start? Is oh, are you referring to the the little quotes? Yeah. At the, so the ch for for those of you who haven't for those of you who haven't finished the book yet, <laughs> I don't know what you were doing this week, but anyway, um, 
the chapters, thank you, Jennifer. The chapters start with little quotes that are, I like to layer things in. So the chapter, I, I mean, when, it, when I read a book and it just says chapter one, then this happened, I think, missed opportunity. Give me a chapter title. So I always have a title that's got a clue. And then I like to use quotes. Um, I've done that with my, my two other books as well. And the idea was to use a source book um, for who, who's, who's an old an old source for, um, for detail about birds, North American birds, um, as, uh, and, uh, as in comparison to the music of bees, I used quotes from L.L. Langstroth, who is a 19th century beekeeper and invented the removable frame hive that we all use. Well, it was harder to find that kind of source book for this book. Audubon is actually pretty boring, not a very interesting writer. <laughs> Um, so then I, I will talk a little bit about the origin of the story, I think, later. But um, I took from our family lake cabin, sorry, you guys, I'm bringing it back, but I borrowed this book that has been in the house um, for 50-some years. And um, it's, a, it's a, any birders here, any bird lovers here, a oh, um, couple. So we have great guidebooks now, and we have... We have apps and we have online stuff. And, and old, old guidebooks from the 70s, they're terrible. The, the pictures are awful. They're in black and white. The script is tiny. But this book had kind of a talismanic feeling to me because it was at the family cabin. And so I rifled through there and stole these little quotes. And then got down to the wire of asking for copyright permission. And it was impossible because the book was so old and the authors are probably dead. And the, it had been sold to some company that got sold to some company. So in the 11th hour... My editor said, why don't you just make it up? And so I did. I made up this person and this guidebook, and that was easier, <laughs> too. It's fun. That's my favorite detail yeah. so far. <laughs> I was just having a conversation with uh, your friend Chris about how delightful fiction is, because you can make stuff up. Absolutely. It's the best. When something's not Nobody working, you just mad. fix it. Exactly. Yeah. If only life could be like that, too. Um, I, I noticed in this story you have sort of this building of it on these pillars of, of relationships. Um, you have this remarkable child in here that is you know, clearly from your own history and also this setting. But I was curious as a reader, like, where did it start for you? Where were you like, this is my next book? The next, uh, the idea for this book came out of um, May 2020. Does everybody remember May of 2020? We don't want to remember May of 2020. Um, I had just turned in the edits for The Music of Bees to my editor. And then I had to, you know, face reality. And I thought, okay, I can do this stay-at-home thing, you know, shelter in place or whatever, because I live in the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, which is beautiful and there are mountain bike trails. We both mountain bike, so she knows really what, how important that is. Um, rivers and hiking trails. I can do this. And then, and then what happened was a whole bunch of people who don't live in small towns in the Northwest that live in cities, they said, let's go live in small towns in the Northwest during COVID because it's better there. And our government freaked out, and they closed all the trails. And they closed everything, state parks, national forests, everything shut down. And I was really stressed and because I realized at that point how important that is to me to be able and how lucky I am to be able to go out in the woods and ca find calm there. And so we have this family place. You may have heard of this lake called Lake Coeur d'Alene. And we, my family has been lucky enough to have a place there since I was two. And I thought, I think I can get there. And so I drove across the state and I got there and I um, I got out of the boat, and the storm was coming over the, the hill behind the house, and I got totally soaked in rain, and I just felt so grateful to be there. And so that's where it, it started. And um, I started writing the book about a year later, but it was it, the, the sense of place was the thing that was the most important to me. Like, where, where is the comfort? And, and that's really where the, the story is seated for me. And it really comes out, too, in your writing about it, this, this journey of Frankie um, being in, in this space with herself that she's so grounded. Did you have that same experience? Yes, I definitely I feel grounded there. And I, these are the kinds of things you don't know about yourself until you start writing or people start asking the questions. But I 
as I said, we've had the place since I was two, and so my first memories were before I even remembered I was I was connected to that place. The the way that you wrote about it, it was clear that you were there, and so I wondered. I was like, I don't know if she sat in that cabin and wrote that whole book. Did you sit there and write that whole book? Not the whole book, but definitely lots of parts of it, yes. yes. And did it inspire the book and the story that you decided to tell through the cabin? Um, not so much. It was more a general place like that. So um, I'll explain um, the cover of the book here, which is so pretty. Um, this really is Mount Adams-ish. The, the uh, illustrator really captured that well. And what I've created, June Lake is a fic fictitious lake at the foot of Mount Adams. And to get there in my story, you have to drive two hours from Hood River to a little town called Mill Three, which doesn't exist. And then you take a boat for two hours to this one little cove of, of houses in Beauty Bay. And at my launch party, in Hood River on Tuesday, I really ripped off the Band-Aid and just was like, hey, folks, I'm going to read the, the beginning and you all are going to hate it because people don't like it when you take issue with you change things in the town they live in. So anyway, but they, all, they were fine with it. They were all real nice about it. But so it was really just um, the feeling, that feeling of place for me, but then Mount Adams really is a touchstone for me as well. And the idea was, what if I take three troubled people and I put them in a location that feels like the one I loved as a kid and maybe what can how can this help them heal and connect did you know the story that you were going to tell then I didn't I knew the setting first which is different my other two books started completely differently how to be a sister is a memoir I wrote that was really built on the scaffolding of family stories that we'd passed around for generations about the hilarity and heartbreak of, of living with my sister Margaret. So that was really at the core, these stories I'd, I'd had, you know, kind of for years just carried around. The music of bees came to me, just literally in, in, in an inspiration on a, on a drive, the first sentence hit me, and then the story just unraveled from there. Like the plot just kept coming. This was very different. It was, and that, which was kind of frustrating because I wanted to, I wanted that hit. I wanted to know where it was going, but it was. I had to just do the setting first. And so, people who have reviewers who have read the first novel com have commented that it starts more slowly. Um, the music of bees starts with uh, the first chapter. There's literally almost an, a, a collision. You know, there's the, the action is right in the forefront, and this is slower. So, the setting came first. The, when you talk about slower, I think about your decision to, for your timing, and we talked about this earlier, that you wanted to put it at a time where people were forced to communicate in person or get very, you have to travel to have a phone, and how that really changed the dynamic in relationships. Was that, did you decide that early? How did you come about that choice? So, yes, I decided early. I started writing the book in summer of 2021, and uh, that summer, remember that summer? <laughs> that was even weirder um, because then we were like, yay, COVID's over. No, it's not. Ha ha. And so um, I remember everyone around me feeling stressed because there was, this, there was no separation between work and home anymore. And you had to be connected all the time and on social media and updating everybody. And it was exhausting. And so I, I remembered feeling so so tired of that, I thought, oh, I'm gonna set this in the 90s. This will be fun because then there can be no smartphones in there at all. Email won't really be a thing. And as I described how far away this place is, you know, the two hour drive and then the two hour drive. So when my characters have issues, they have to deal with each other either in person or over the phone, over the pay phone that you have to drive to because there's no landline. Um, or through the U.S. mail, which I feel so romantic about. I mean, mm -hmm. the internet is great, but isn't it cool that you can like write a thing and put it in a box and then it goes across the country? Like that's pretty cool and ends up with somebody. I, feel, I still am a big fan of the postal service. And so that was fun. But then also what it did for the story is it totally slowed everything down. So when people had conflict, they couldn't just try to fix it with a quick text message or something like that. They had to really be intentional about their, their interactions with each other. Mm. The 
when you're talking about the post, um, I and you described those blue uh, airmail envelopes from Europe. I I spent a lot of time in Europe and traveling back and forth, and I remembered them. And there was such there was such a like tangible nostalgia to that. And I don't know about everybody else, but I really miss those days, the pre-smartphone days. We're gonna get back there one way or another. Yeah. Um, there is something else. Oh, conflict. When you're talking about conflict, there's a scene kind of early, mid in the book, where Frankie, she's she's had some questionable behavior, and she wants to go make amends, but she has to go talk to the guy. Not, you know, she's not communicating real great yet, and she's doing just that. She has to go address it, and there is a lot of that interaction, whether it's bringing food over or making apologies, and this awkwardness. I don't want to have you call any of your friends or family out here, but <laughs> how did you learn about all those awkward interactions? Um, I love awkward. I do. I mean, life is awkward, and, and, and telling someone how you really feel is difficult, but I, I find it fascinating to... Um, I mean, certainly I don't love it in my own personal life. It's hard, but but... But being able to imagine it, what would it be like, and what would that person be, what would their body language be like, and what if the other person didn't respond correctly right away, and these kind of like, you know, one person tries, it's like one step up and two, or two steps up and one steps back. I don't, I don't know, I just find that, I find conflict interesting, I guess. <laughs> I guess I've had, have I had a lot of con uh, experience with conflict? Anybody want to no, jump in here? Nobody and... say anything. This is Eileen's night. She's an angel. Yeah. She's done no wrong. Yeah, no. Perfect child. Yes. There, there was a really craftful way in which you approached some difficult things with such compassion that I, I personally found magical. I'm sure everyone else will as well. And what struck me as well as a mother was how, how artfully you described um, Anne's emotion about her son who has is on the autism spectrum disorder. And I know you have everybody, and I hope everybody knows that, that you have history there. And how did that inform you? And did you, did you talk to your mom about that or other friends? And you said you also parented your sister. And so that emotion came out so well. Tell me about that. So one of the characters in the book is a five-year-old boy. I'm sorry, you know this, but I'm just going to tell them. Um, um, one of the characters is a five-year-old boy who, named Aiden who has stopped speaking and nobody knows why. And so this is the character that we're, we're talking about here. And, um, and it, yes, in it, from uh, a 2024 perspective, anybody would look at that the first way I describe him and say, oh, that kid has autism. But in, I set the book in 98, you know, part of that, I and I had to pay attention to what would have been known at that time. And I, I'm the youngest of five kids in an, uh, five kids in a, all born within six years, big Irish Catholic family. And one of my siblings has severe autism. I was born right around the time she was diagnosed. And so I, I really never knew life differently than with Margaret. And Margaret didn't speak until she was seven. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I knew that. I've heard, you know, my parents, we all know the, our family stories. But, but as a kid, as I was often kind of her companion as the youngest girl helping, helping out, as, as often happens with girls and families. And I, have, I don't remember thinking, oh, Margaret doesn't talk. I remember being, feeling very close to her and always having a sense of what or trying to understand what she needed and wanted. And so that's always been part of me. And when I created this character, taking him from being a, a typically developing child and then having him stop speaking, that was kind of the lens with which I was trying to craft Aiden. And, and the emotion around that, where Anne really is struggling to connect and she's having all of this love, the that deep sorrow and pain that was captured in there, I have to ask where that came from. How did you know that? Well, uh, those of you who know me know I don't have kids. Um, you know I don't have kids. So I, I don't know. I think I just, I have, I see my friends raising their children and just that the impossibility of it. Like I had a friend say once, you know, ever since I had a kid, I feel like I have a hole open <laughs> inside of me that's never going to heal again because you just can't, no matter how much you do, it's never enough and it's never the right thing. And, and for, for um, Anne, 
she's a typical mom in a lot of ways that she's trying to connect and she she can't for whatever reason. And I know personally for me that is deeply rooted in my relationship with Margaret because I love her so much, but I can never know she knows. I mean, she can't. So that communication, that rift will always be there. And yet it's with that way with every human relationship. No matter how much you love somebody and want them to know that, you can't quite ever, you can't, the other person can't really feel what you're feeling. And I find that a really fascinating and frustrating part of the human condition. <laughs> it is both of those things. <laughs> the other piece that you have in here too, though, even while we're, we're witnessing this relationship and some of the sorrow, you have this beautiful friendship developing, which makes me curious too, as, as a reader, who, who informed that for you? And have friendships been part of your story? What, what brought that to you? I guess your last story too was really about friendship. As well, like. Yes, unexpected friendship. I'm a big fan of that. I don't really know where that comes from, but I liked. Just, um, we just got one. I, like, <laughs> uh, I don't oh know, I, but I, I like that. <laughs> that same, same. Um, that you have these people that seem like they would have nothing in common. I have an ornithologist, and then I have an Irish musician and composer, but they're they're about the same age and. And they're both struggling with very personal grief that they can't share with the people closest to them. And that's the thing that ends up, they don't talk about that, you know, it's not a Hallmark book. Um, <laughs> but that's the underlying thing. And I don't, I feel that sometimes that those connections, the unexpected ones are the most rewarding. I found that in my own life. So it was fun to, to play with that with Frankie and Anne. The, um, and you did it so, so well. It was really, it reminded me of all my friends that are so precious to me. So it was a sweet, sweetness in that. The, um, Anne, as a musician, I also found really fascinating. Do you play music? I play the ukulele and I am, uh, I sing. I have a band. Um, we're called Lady Eight and we kill. We're amazing. Um, Yes, but uh, we Garvins are all kind of, we don't have any training, but we're all musically, um, naturally talented, so it's fun. Ah. <laughs> I see Rob's back there making notes about when to sign you guys up. <laughs> um, and the music theory, and she talks a lot about like emotion behind her, her experience of composing, and she's also bringing in all these names and artists, and I felt very uninformed. Uh, your research on all levels, whether it was birds or nature or music, was incredible. I'm wondering how much coffee you drink. <laughs> I don't drink that much coffee, actually. I, oh, I, I, don't, I mean, I love coffee so much, and I really had to break up with coffee. I, I, was, try, I was asking the bar earlier. The, my first question was, like, do you have any caffeine? I've been trying to get caffeine all day. The universe told me not so much caffeine is better for you. So, no, um, just a little bit. Yeah, healthy living <laughs> goes a long way. <laughs> Don't tell Rob, he's got like five energy drinks back there. The, when you were writing this book, I know that in, your, in all those interviews, everybody was asking like, what's your next project? When you're, when you're buried in, in the beauty of something like this, do other ideas come to you that you think, oh wait, this doesn't fit in this book, but I've got another one. No, I kind of have a one-track mind. I really do. I have had the experience in the past where I was writing two books at the same time, and it was maddening. It really was. It was like my brain needed to spit them both out at the same time, and I would work on one until I got sick of it, and then i work on the other one. But this, I really just kind of stayed in it, and, and then I, I felt like... Uh, I, felt, I think a lot of writers feel like this. You finish it and then you think, oh, I'll never do anything ever again. It's over. I feel terrible. Uh, it's like you broke up with somebody because now it's out of your hands. And, and happily, it didn't take very long. And I, I, another, I, I got another idea. And I was like, oh, great. OK, so now I can go. Now my brain can do this game. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, if I, find that, I would find that frustrating if another idea came along because it's like... Uh, it's like another conversation that you don't have time to have right now. Yeah. I have friends that are like that, that could just write. They're working on eight different projects at the same time. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to share some ADD meds with you now. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, when you're between projects or when you're therapying yourself through a project, um, you keep bees. 
I do. I am a backyard beekeeper. I have had hives since 2014. And we were talking earlier about how many, how many bees, because I keep reading different numbers, and I'm trying to imagine, I'm hearing these crazy numbers of bees, and I'm thinking, so where do you live? Like, like there's, <laughs> how many acres do you have? How many workers do you have? And how, <laughs> and, and are bees a replacement for therapy? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, no, um, sure, yes. No, the thing is, you can really fit a lot of bees into a small space. So when you get a package of bees, a brand new package of bees, it's about, the box is about the size of one of these books and it's 10,000 bees in there. So a, a hive at its, a, a typical hive that North American beekeepers use at its maximum population has about 60,000 bees. So you really just need, you don't need acres. The thing is, to, as far as what they eat, they're not just hanging out in my backyard and snacking. They will fly up to two miles away to forage. So they, they mostly forage for, I think my bees are getting blackberry blossoms mostly from the trail near my house. And so all your honey tastes like blackberries? My honey tastes pretty good. Yeah, it's kind of darker that way. Yeah. Well, I think it's time. I see Christy over there saying, handing a signal. We're going to take some questions from the audience, and then I'll probably interrupt with some more of my own just because. All right. Yeah, actually, and I see some of you guys uh, recording this uh, as well, and I love that. Uh, we're also live streaming, and so there'll be a recording afterwards for you guys to catch anything and to catch yourself asking a question. If you have any questions for the author... I, oh, over here to the side, I see a Spokane celeb, one of my favorites, Chris Dennison, right here, asking. Um, I was just curious, I, Amy approached this, but a little bit more about your research process, because I thought that the research in this book was just like very wonderful and intense, even though you just admitted to making some of this stuff up. But um, <laughs> like, what do you, do you go to like, do you do interviews? Do you go out into the field? Like, what are some of the things you do to, um, to do research for your books? Thanks, Chris. Um, for this book, I mostly did, I just, I read a lot of books. I read a lot of books about birds. I read the, the crow detail comes principally from the work of John Marsliff, who's a Corvid expert at University of Washington and also a really nice person. I, I decided to use his uh, crow facial recognition study, which is very famous, as a cornerstone for, for the story. And because it's, he's written so many books and it's, it's public, and so I didn't think I'd get in that copyright, you know, problem I described with the the bird book, and um, and then towards the end of the editorial process, my editor said, well, "Why don't you just reach out to him and let him know?" Oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you this part. I made him a character in the book because I just thought, well, I'm using all this stuff. Why make up somebody who sounds like? him when it's really just him and I'm using his research it's all just right there giving him credit for it so I just said wrote, she said Let, just ask him if it's okay and how he feels about it and so I wrote to him and I thought okay I'm, I'm he's either gonna say absolutely not take my name out or he would just not respond well he wrote back and he said oh I'd love to see the pages with my name on them and I was like so I cut and pasted all the ones with his name and then he wrote back and said interesting can I see the whole book and I said <laughs> sure and so then about a week later he writes back my my wife and I who's also an ornithologist we loved it here are our notes and he gave me all these <laughs> notes this famous bird expert gave me all these notes so it was so that was so fabulous yeah. But, but also aberrant. Uh, most of my work with the bird stuff was, was books. I read some fantastic um, science and also uh, naturalist essays for that piece. Um, and the rest of it, I can't really re think about what sort of research I did. It was pretty atmospheric and just personal, you know, um, uh, Im imagining the, the environment and things. Yeah. Yes, Don? Can I, can I ask a follow-up question? Is this the gentleman that had research on the Burke Gilman Trail, um, and the, and the, they took out a tree, and then these crows remembered the people that took it out. Oh, and it, so I don't I don't know about that, but I'll, what I'll tell you what you know stuff. What John Marsliff is known for, he and his graduate students captured and banded a few crows in the University of Washington Arboretum area while wearing caveman masks, and a friend reminded me they also did it with J Dick Cheney masks. <laughs> And then they went back to see if the crows re remembered them. And uh, they went back just in their regular faces, and the birds ignored them. And then they put the masks on, and the birds just erupted. They were so angry. And they went back 
week after week, month after month, year after year, these birds still remember those faces, which means that they not only remembered, but they taught their babies, yeah. they taught their peers, they spread the word all over campus. So I love that. And, and, it, and it, by the same token, Marsleff has also written about how birds, uh, crows and other corvids remember allies. So people who have helped them will, will uh, there's one story about um, a woman helping a little bird that was just wounded, just helped it for a short period of time, sheltered it from some other birds that were after it, and it, you know, bring her presents and things. So, yeah, so, um, but I don't know about that Burt Kilman Trail tree incident, but I... I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I, I believe it. I have a friend who is Australian and there are uh, magpies in, in, her, in her neighborhood that are also in the Corvid family. And one, one spring she walked too close to one of their nests and now she can't use the side door of her home during, during nestling season because the, the, this magpie family is like, here she comes again, you know, get her. And they just, they dive bomb her and... Smart. Uh, researching, um, you know, lake life, having grown up uh, on a lake yourself, uh, one of the things, the Pagati, and I never, ever, um, st st I, I was born on Cape Cod, but me driving a boat, nope, doesn't happen. But that whole rite of passage of learning how to motor a boat and how to, you know, the right of ways and all of that stuff, uh, and then getting all of that extra boat info, did that come from family lore? Yes, yeah, so so the the Peggy, which is Peggy, which is there, um, named for our our family boat, the Peggy, that was a 1965. Thank you, Larry. Raven. Thank you. Um, we so you got to yeah. steer that boat a lot. I, I hear. Well, not a lot actually, Christy, because I was the youngest of five, and so I I mean I I didn't really learn to operate an automobile until I was in my twenties because. <laughs> There's always like a bunch of people ahead of me with the keys in their hands. But yes, I have now learned how to safely operate a boat and safety is very important. And, and I love that. I like putting Frankie in there in the boat and, and, and the detail about safe driving and right of way and all that business. Nice. Oh, did I miss something over the side? I had a question too while you're walking around. Okay. The um, the you brought in a lot of lore about about crows and myth. Where did you find all that? Just just internet or like? No. So yes. Yeah, so that is um, from my weirdly um, prolific collection of children's books for a person who has no children in her home. I love fairy tales. I love Grimm's fairy tales. Hans Christian Andersen. Neil Gaiman stuff, um, and I grew up uh, reading these. Um, I don't know how many of you have revisited your fairy tales in recent years. I mean, they're they're kind of creepy. There's some really the old ones are really, there's all the mean stepmothers doing really questionable things to children and a lot of neglect and things. But um, when I decided to, I use the fairy tales in the story um, as really spoiler alert. Um, it really has to do with Aiden, and he, he's not talking, but he's obsessed with his storybook, and he's trying to use it to, to explain what's happening in his world, and I, I knew I wanted to do that, and so I started looking back at all my old books, and I was, you know how it is when you start, you get your mind focused on something, and then you see it everywhere? I, there are so many of these stories that were about birds, and in, people who were enchanted and turned into birds, and um, young girls and women especially, but also boys who were, um, had, had their voice taken from them by some enchantment and something had to happen, some quest had to happen for them to be freed. It was just everywhere. And so the ones that I picked in to use in, in the book, I've paraphrased, but they really are directly from all these sources that we all have grow up reading, right? we grew up reading. That was a really neat uh, aspect of the book for me too, is how, how you went and tried to come into this little young man's mind through the fairy tale telling. And it brought, you know, I think sometimes when we're, when we're reading and people are making up these ideas and we're trying to imagine what a character is thinking, getting inside a child's mind and especially a mind that functions a little bit differently is uh, tedious and, and I would argue these days even a little dangerous. Um, but that was a, a really remarkable and, and delightful way to do it, and also so empathetic. 
I'm, now I'm not even asking you anything. I'm just telling you just, more reasons why I like you. Just gush, yeah. Keep no, going. It's <laughs> beautiful. I've got a question back here. Hi, I was wondering how you deal with uh, like writer's block, any sort of artist block, uh, especially if you've experienced like severe writer's block. Um, I, I actually hadn't until you just said it. Now I feel really anxious. <laughs> No, I'm teasing. Um, I, I, don't, I don't get writer's block. I feel like I, I read somewhere ma many years ago, a, a writer far more articulate than I am, say that it's really just anxiety. And so when I'm feeling like I can't work on something, it means I have to go do something else. Like go for a bike ride, yay! Go for a bike ride, take a nap, read a book, hang out with my friends. But um, the... So that's part of it, is recognizing it, that it's just a signal to stop. And the other part is, um, I think, writing enough, just having the practice every day and not having expectations. I've trained myself to realize, this is just something I do. There's not necessarily going to be a payoff at the end of it. It's not going to necessarily turn into a manuscript or turn into a book, but it's just what I do all the time. So it takes, it takes away the scariness of it. It becomes like a yoga practice. There's um, something I refer to as laundry writing, which uh, one, of, one of my great guides in life had taught me years ago that that was part of my process. And having permission just to go and be like, go for the mountain bike ride and be like, oh, actually, I need to make some space for the stuff that's in there that's going to come back out. Are you a person who sits down every day and it's like 9 o'clock, like, oh, it's time for me to go to work? I write, when I'm working on a project, I work, I start every day at like 6 or 6.30. And yes, AM? I, AM. AM, yes. I wish I could work at night, but no, I can't, I can't do that. And I just, I figured out that that is the time that my brain is ready to do the thing, and then I had to <clears throat> make a space for it. And, and then it became just this thing I do. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right about, did you call it laundry writing? Yeah. yeah the, the best idea is, happen when I'm away from my desk. So you have to do that other stuff to mix up your brain to go have ideas and then come back and, and put them down on, on paper. How do you remember mm -hmm. them? Well, sometimes, like with the music of bees, I, I, I literally got the first sentence for the novel on a car ride. And I'd been working as a reporter for years before that and then writing essays, personal essays, and I knew that you know, I'll remember that when I get home. Mm, it doesn't work. So I just pulled over. I always have pens everywhere, and I just scribbled it down. So um, when, it's, when it's a really good idea like that, I will stop and scribble it down. When it's just um, a, a feeling, I just kind of ruminate on it for the run or the ride and, and then go back and write it down as soon as I get back to the house. Oh. You have a follow-up? I have a music question. Mm. Yeah, you go. <laughs> I actually had a music question, too. Oh, was it about all those the Irish music and composing no. and how that... No, you mean? asked that question. Well, well, Mine was far more self-serving. <laughs> <laughs> I loved the whole idea of taking you know, the second, uh, second choice of her music scholarship to come in and how she was writing music and the whole Irish lore of it. You said you came from an Irish family and you are a musical yourself, so that was, is that the inspiration for Boom? She's gonna be an Irish lass with all of the answers for all of the things. That was my really bad broke, sorry. No, that's pretty good, Christy. I think that's pretty good. The Irish definitely was inspired by the family. Um, my great-grandparents were immigrants. So my grandmother was a first generation, and we grew up you know, just kind of with that, that, that feeling, listening to those stories. And her family, her parents started a cigar store during Prohibition. And then it became Ryan's Tavern, which operated until 1964? About then. Thanks, Mom. Let me off the hook. So, um, yeah, so this, this family, the, the Irish comes from that. And the music is more akin to what I described about being a wannabe biologist. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a musician, but I'm a, I'm a small town amateur hack who sings with my girlfriends. Um, and, but Anne went to you know, music school and she composed with her friend and she got to come to America and go to Cornish and become a, a, a writer in residence there. And that whole life, that's a life that I don't have that I think would be extremely entertaining. You write about it like it's yours. Well, it's you. lovely. Yeah. yeah, really, really <laughs> Maybe lovely. there's still time. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, you ask your selfish question there, Amy, and then if there's a... Uh, I wanted to know if you had a banjo in your band. No, no banjo. We have a cello, though. Do you, do. But do you need a banjo? Oh, <laughs> deeply need a banjo, yes. Oh, this okay, is getting I'll, really good. I'll learn how to play one then. <laughs> my next project. There we go. All right. We have a... I think it's easy. <laughs> It'll be fine. Oh, we have another question. I, yeah. I think you're going to be... Um, you better start, like, working your hand, because I think you're going to have a lot of notes to write in books oh. soon. Yeah, okay. I'll try <laughs> so, with my left hand. So I appreciate your recognition um, that it was maybe the response more so to COVID that caused some of the crazy changes that we had to deal with, and that you actually had to leave your home or your house, let's say, to go back to your home, to your cabin. And, and that was a major change probably from your normal writing style. And so just curious logistically, what other changes in the publishing business did you have to overcome during that challenging time to get this book done? Well, um, you just made me think of something else. I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask me first, which is the biggest change to my writing life was that um, my neighbors were home all the time. And I'm a childless person who lives in... And the neighbors they apparently didn't know that the neighbor neighborhood belongs to me between the hours of 8 and 5. And now they were home all the time and everyone was just frantic and, and the kids were playing outside all the time at weird hours when I'd be like, no, I'm supposed to be hearing the faint sounds of the playground, not you on the trampoline again. <laughs> as much as I love you next door neighbor children. So that was hard. And the publishing industry was bananas. I sold the book in February, sad trombone sound, right? I had no idea what was gonna happen. I sold it in February of 2020 and some people had books come out then that they'd worked on for years and it was just, it, you know, you know, it was just all the things that were planned like this were canceled. So I was far enough um, my book came out in 2021, so by that time, people really, it was cool to see how the industry rallied and figured out Zoom and figured out how to do these things that were sort of a stopgap. Um, I got to do Northwest Passages Book Club Zoom with wonderful Chris, um, and that was, I was elated because I went from feeling like, yay, I got a book, you know, I'm going to get a book published, to thinking, I have no idea what will happen. So um, it was a, a weird time, but... Um, I think the industry has found some creative solutions. Now there's hybrid things that happen where events like this can be in person, but sometimes like this one being broadcast for people who can't or don't want to be, you know, in, in large gatherings. So it's it's been a mixed blessing. Another question? Pardon me? So I don't get you know, to... I'm in uh, Idaho and we didn't have COVID. <laughs> oh, I heard that you're so lucky. <laughs> my, my town, we heard about it. <laughs> We heard about it, but we, we prayed our way safe. Yeah. Well. And, um, and then we served all y'all ice cream. Oh, wow. We have a lot to learn. We yeah. have a lot to learn, don't we? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we're learning it now. I am a Grammy, and I loved your reference as a Grammy. Um, I don't hear that very often. And then also, do you write better on paper, or do you write better on the computer? Um, I thank you. I'm 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 glad you love. I'm glad you are a Grammy. Grammys are the best. Um, I wish I wrote on paper. I used to, and I think it's there's something about. I, I still jur I journal a lot, but I can barely read my own handwriting anymore. Um, there's something about the the physical feeling of pen on paper that connects with your brain. I'm sure someone way smarter than me has figured this out that is good for you or causes you to be more creative. But I can't. I can't keep up with my, the pace of my thoughts, so I write on my computer. And also, it makes me think about how books used to get written with typewriters and things, or handwriting and then typewriters, and I mean, all of us here use the computer all the time. Cut and paste is just fantastic. Being able to reorganize your thoughts, I don't know how, I think that'd be very difficult. I had a... Uh a friend I talked into going on a writing with, retreat with me, and she has a tech job. And so I, I was like, she said, oh, should I just bring my journal and just handwrite? And I was like, oh, yeah, no, yeah, just bring that. That'll be fine. 
And, and every day we flipped a coin, basically, for who got to use my laptop. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Question in the second row. So this is not book related, but this music, I know you have some family members here who I know a few of them. Do you feel like you could like finish with a song or a family music band? Oh, you guys want to do a medley? Totally. They would love that. Come on up, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> we can hang them up with a mic. It's all fine. <laughs> or we could ask the dreaded last question. You know what would be a really great question right now is, is you know, what, what, what's next? What, what are you working on next? I mean, are we, are we at that point, people? <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that you're working on something. Uh, you don't have to talk about it. But. I, I'm working on another novel that is um, Music of Bees adjacent. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. But I, I can't say too much more about it. Well, uh, is it going to come out in 2025 so I can put you on the calendar? Oh, I, I, I don't think we're quite there yet, but okay. man. You know yeah. my number. I'll, I'll write faster. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying, I will hold a space 2026, whatever. Northwest Passages will absolutely have you back. Oh, thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.